Okay, everybody, welcome to tonight's webinar hosted by New Zealand Parliament. We will be talking about the Māori electorates and the Māori electorate role. Um, my name is Maika Teamo. I work across a few of the teams at Parliament. Uh, I'm from Tapuika, uh, northern coastal Te Arawa, with strong links to um, almost all the iwi on the Te Arawa Waka, as well as uh, Ngāti Awa, Ngāti Mutahi, uh, and Te Uri o Hau, uh, on the Kaipara there or Tamatea. Um, and when I grow up, I'd like to be a Jedi. Tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, I'd like to pass the rākau kōrero on to our panellists uh, now to allow them to introduce themselves. Kei taku rangatira, kei taku tuaka nei kura. Kei akoe. Ara, tēnā koutou e haramai rā, ki roti tō tātou kore kōrero i te pōnei. Uh, kia ora, my name is Kura Moehu and I am the Tunu Whakarai, the Principal Advisor Māori within Parliamentary Services. Kia ora. And I also have from uh, uh, the tribes of eight tribes of Taranaki, um, and also strong links here uh, to Te Atiawa and Ngāti Tōa here in Wellington. Kia ora koutou. Kei ka mua tūau ki te tihire hurehu o pūtaua ki maunga, e te upu kenga e te wānanga, paerau, tēnā koe. Uh, tēnā koe, tēnā koe, Maika. Uh, tēnā koutou katoa, mi atu uh, ki a koutou e paanga ngā hui hui nei. Um, I'm uh, Peter Warbrick. I'm talking to you today, this evening, from down in Otago. It's still a bit late here. And I'm originally from the Whakatane area, from Ngātiawa, is my principal iwi. Uh, my last name is Warbrick, and that is a Te Arawa name. And Te Arawa married into Ngātiawa. And I'm linked with all the various Arawa tribal groups, as well as the other Matacho ones, as well, strong links right throughout there. And um, I'm a lecturer, senior lecturer here in Tutumu School of Māori, Pacific and Indigenous Studies at the University of Otago. And I'm also a part time lawyer in Dunedin here, dealing with Māori land. So that's my particular background. And I call it all, do lectures on this particular uh, Māori electorate stuff as well as politics, Treaty of Waitangi, Tamiya So, kia ora rā. Mm, kia ora rā atu. Ka whakawiti atu au i te awa o raha, ki atu a kua awa ki te o neone i te tauiho o te waka a Māui. Kai te mārai kura, kai te tua hine. Mauna Pauline, tēnā koe. Uh, tēnā koe, Maika. Uh, tēnā rā koutou. E, kua tai mai nei ki tēnei hui hui ngā masihiko. My name is Mona Pauline Mangakahia. On my father's side, I hail from the Coromandel or Hauraki Moana. And uh, my mother, all the way from Ngāti Raukawa ki Tunga, right down and across in Tarangitane, across the top of the South Island and ending uh, in Kaikoura uh, with Kaitahu. Uh, my role at the Electoral Commission is to support communities to access our services by way of enrolment um, and making sure that our Whānau and our hapuri are prepared for the upcoming general election. Kia um, So welcome to our panellists and welcome to everyone watching as well. Um, now, just to uh, a quick reminder, this uh, webinar is going to be about the, um, the Māori electorates and the Māori role. And beginning with a history, a bit of a history covering the Māori electoral role, we have set aside a big bunk, uh, chunk of time towards the end uh, to cover any questions that you have. So people in the Zoom webinar, drop your questions into the chat. Uh, people on Facebook, um, comment on the live stream and then um, we'll hopefully get to as many of your questions as possible, including a few of the early birds you got in before we even kicked off. Uh, and just one thing I'd like to reiterate, this evening's webinar will be a um, inform information sharing um, 
uh, webinar, uh, where we won't uh, include words like should or must or um, that, that kind of thing. Information sharing as opposed to a debate. Tēnā uh, One thing that we have got for you this evening is a poll. Um, this is one in a series of webinars that are being run by Parliament and we'd like to know that we're running them at the right time. They are available afterwards um, on demand, but we would like to know whether or not this time slot for the live stream suits you. So please get into the, into the poll. Um, let us know what you think. And we'll leave that for a few seconds. Give everybody an opportunity to uh, share their thoughts. Just a few more seconds. Gee, if I was a good host, I probably would have prepared a joke or something. Oh, probably best I didn't. Dad jokes in this whare. Tēnā koutou. Wow, that's fairly uh, comprehensive. Looks like uh, the evening slot is the most preferred by this particular audience. Makes sense, you're all here in the evening. Norera tēnā koutou, thank you for, very much for that. Um, <laughs> Now, to, to start things off this evening, we'd like to uh, share with you a, a little bit of information around the Tiriti o Waitagi and its role. Um, Kaitaku te akana e kura. Would you like to kick us off? Oh, yeah. I think um, one, of the, one of the things that uh, I've often heard around the Treaty of Waitagi, particularly a question that came a little bit earlier was, what are the links between um, or whites under the Treaty of Waitangi and the established uh, Māori seats. And that um, basically the Treaty of Waitangi marked the beginning of the constitutional government. And so, um, and that the Māori seats were established by, by, the, by the Māori Represent Representation Act of 1867. But it actually does have its, cause, its, its origins back at the signing of the treaty, because if you look at the history uh, of of the history of um, how, how we got the Māori seats, it is, is so entrenched in it. Um, but I, if you could just go to the first slide, that would be great. Thank you. And so um, there are a number of um, legislations that uh, that uh, we talked about the Māori Representation Act of 1867 although their origins actually were owned to much of the New Zealand Constitutional Act, um, it was actually passed by the British Parliament back in, in 18, um, 1852. And as you say, there in, ESC, there in 1853, the New Zealand Constitution Act. And so um, at that point in time, the House of Representatives was, was actually uh, consist of between the 24 to 42 members at that point in time. However, none of those seats were actually set aside for Māori. None of those seats. And, um, and Section 71 of that Act also provided uh, by way of letters for certain districts within Aotearoa to be set inside in which uh, Māori laws, customs and usage were basically maintained for, um, for Māori to govern themselves, really. Um, and, and all their relationships and dealings with one another. And so it kind of um, goes back to, to that point in time. And um, due to um, where the New Zealand Constitution granted the franchise for both the provincial councils and the House of Representatives just to all males at that point in time, including males, who were um, over the age of 21 years and who actually had um, any of the following. One was whether they had any freehold estate uh, within the electorate, whether they had any leasehold uh, within the annual value, or whether they were a, a tenement within an annual rental. So um, very few Māori were able to vote, um, since most of the land held by Māori was, um, was communal land, 
and rather than that by the individuals, and it was held in customary title, which was unregistered. And so it does have its impact in terms of the Treaty of Waitangi, uh, just in terms of that slide. If we can go to the next, and then, uh, and this is just an example, and then I'm going to hand it over to, to my colleague, is that the, the first general election began in Russell Bay of Ireland's on the 14th of July, 1853, and ran until um, early October. So there's a few months in between there, isn't there? And there, as I mentioned, there were 24 electorates, but they didn't cover the whole country. Um, and it wasn't until 1867 that the Māori electorate seats were actually created. As I previously mentioned, males over the age of 21 who owned or leased or rented property um, of a certain value could only vote, which meant that Māori men couldn't vote because most of them were excluded because of the land and being in communal um, rather than individual. So um, voters could vote more than once uh, at that point in time. And so if a man held or owned land or lease or property in several electorates, he could actually vote within each one uh, for more than, than the candidate. So I'd just like to leave it there. And ka hoa tu rākau ki ki tō tata whanau o pūtaua ki mango. Tēnā koe. Kia ora, kura. Uh, thank you for that. I'd like to uh, back up what uh, kura had said in regard to with the Treaty of Waitangi. It said about uh, constitutional government for New Zealand, uh, but also within the treaty, for those who may know uh, finer details about the treaty, it, it guaranteed towards Māori the same rights and privileges as British subjects. Uh, and what you actually had, of course, if you're males in Britain, they had the right to vote, vote for parliament. And so, that's some background to setting up uh, Māori rights to actually have a vote. And then between 1840 and 1852, we had in New Zealand crown colony a period, which was that the governors ruled. They were dictators. They did whatever they wanted to. But then, of course, the Pākehā settlers, they wanted some representation. So along uh, came various acts, the Constitution Acts passed by Britain to set up some representation for New Zealand. So they set it all up. They said, right, all males over the age of 21, if you've got some sort of property, then you can vote. And theoretically, Māori were able to vote in theory and um, and choose their representatives. But what happened in practice was when they went to go and register to vote, they were denied. They were denied registering or denied the ability to vote. And the settlers came up with all sorts of ideas why they shouldn't vote, uh, including that they held communal land instead of individual land. But the background to it, it, it shouldn't be uh, uh, amazing to anyone. There was, it was racism, prejudice against Māori, because when the parliament was set up, it was envisaged by the settlers that it was going to be a parliament of settlers, not Māori. And then all of a sudden, when Māori started to actually want to vote, it's the realization that, well, hey, some of these representatives in Parliament may actually have to listen to Māori. Or the alternative is that maybe some of these Māori will actually get enough votes behind them to be elected in the Parliament. And so that changes some things. So there was a lot of exclusion of Māori votes, in fact. And that was the reason why, why uh, there started to be a call or separate uh, Māori representation. Uh, I see there was a, a particular question in regard to whether the criteria was the same in Britain for over here in New Zealand. To a degree, to a degree, it, it was similar. So there was similar, you had to own some particular property. But the reality is 
and I'm, I'm talking about what you have down on paper and what the political reality is are two different things. So what you actually had in New Zealand, the Pākehā population, males, that is, we actually had universal suffrage. All males could actually vote, in fact, because when the Pākehā males went to the polls, they weren't ever questioned about the value of their land, or even, in fact, whether they had land or not. They just rocked up and voted. So that's just something to be aware of. What some things are said on paper and what happens in practice are always two different things in that way. Now, I know I'm going on and on in, in regard to, I just want to uh, give information, some background to all of this and that. And just one other point to back up Kura was in regard to the governor had power under the Constitution Act to turn around and set aside some Māori districts to allow Māori to essentially govern themselves, but that never actually happened, uh, ever. The governors had contemplated it, but they never did. And that. Now, just for the current slide, you've got uh, there the 1860s, what you actually had was that because the parliament was set up in New Zealand, Britain started to move away from intervening a lot of the time in New Zealand. They said, "Radio, you New Zealanders, you look after your own business, including native affairs issues, Maori business. So they left the parliament to do all sorts of things, the New Zealand parliament. And, and because Maori did not have representation in it, the other uh, settlers passed all these different acts of parliament that were quite frankly against Maori interests. And for example, the Native Lands Act, individualizing title to Maori land. And there's also some other nasty legislation that was passed as well, 1860s, that gave the governor the power to confiscate Māori lands, but that's a different kaupapa than that. By 1867, it was becoming quite uh, obvious that Māori did need representation. They did need to vote because the New Zealand wars had, had uh, been fought in Waikato, Taranaki Bay of Plenty area, and some of the Pākehā politicians thought it is far better to channel Māori aspirations into Parliament. So they set aside these special seats for them. And that, if, I know I've blurted on and that, but if we can go to the, the next slide, uh, please. So you've got some various uh, uh, other things that happened along the way. Oh, by the way, the, the original act that set up the Māori seats, it was only supposed to be for a period of five years, but it was renewed in 1872, and in the 1890s, it was just set in stone in terms of it was entrenched. So the Māori seats were here to stay in that. And they started tinkering with the legislation in regard to voting. Uh, Māori could vote in certain other seats if they held certain land titles, but the parliament always altered certain uh, legislation to deny Māori some of the vote. So that was just some of the things that uh, was happening there in the latter part of the 19th century. If we can go to the, the next slide. So there you have some more particular things that happened in uh, Parliament in regard to changing of the rules. What you actually had in New Zealand, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm just wondering whether people actually realise this, probably not, but New Zealand had two Houses of Parliament. We actually had an, an upper chamber right up until 1950. And that was the Legislative Council. And 
1872, you actually had the government at the time appointing two Māori into the upper chamber, the Legislative Council. And um, they were Māori that happened to be uh, friendly towards whatever government was in power at the time. Now, as time went on, what you actually had was, as part of Parliament, you have select committees there. If Kura, you could talk about some of the select committees, like the Native Affairs Select Committee or Māori Affairs Select Committee, how that works? Or you have to uh, unmute uh, yourself, Kura. Then, no. Mark, with the the Maori uh, Maori Select Committee um, is actually made up of a collective of members from the various parties, and um, the chairman is normally um, the representative from the government of the day. Um, in terms of the the seating arrangements, and um, it's all all to do with status. Um, in terms of you know, the seniority um, within within the Māori Select Committee. They hear a number of um, matters that pertain to um, uh, issues that affect Māori and they, they have a formal process. And later on, we can give an example of the process that like many Select Committees follow. Um, um, and how it actually gets to um, the Royal Assent. Um, but the role of the Māori uh, Select Committee is to continue to make inquiries um, about a number of issues that relate to, that are related to Māori kūpapa. So kia ora tēnā. If I can just add on from um, what Paido has shared, is if we if we go back to the 1950s um, and the electoral population for the general seats um, on which the number and distribution of seats was actually based on and calculated on the total population. On the total population. And they defined this as all non-Māori and their children, but also included Māori children. The Māori electoral population by comparison was actually based on Māori people of voting age only. Um, and this actually created a sense of grievance uh, felt by many Māori voters um, that their children were actually being used um, to increase the number of non-Māori seats. Um, almost uh, immediately following um, when we look at the from 1867 and almost immediately following the introduction of the Māori seats in 1867, Māori through petitions, uh, through parliamentary resolutions and introduced bills argued that the number of Māori seats should be determined on the population basis just as were the general seats. Um, and in 1871, the Eastern Māori Karaitiana Takamuana uh, moved a resolution, um, not passed in the House, that called for an increase in the level of Māori representation. Um, another bill introduced in 1871 by the Southern Māori of that time, um, by Tairo, uh, repeated the demand. So the same year, and it was for it to be based on, on the population. So the struggle to get a fair population of Māori representation um, based on population was a struggle. And in 1930s, with the Ratana movement, succeeded in having its candidate elected to parliament um, on a platform for electoral reform. Once again, including the increase of the number of Māori seats to six rather than from four. And based, based on the reflecting back on the, uh, the growth of the Māori population. 
Um, if we can go to the next slide. Thank you. Oh, no, sorry. Um, uh, there was the one with the just before the 1975 elections. Okay, to buy, I'll continue. Um, and then after, uh, uh, where, 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 where. and then about 90, 98 years later, in 1965, Southern Māori, uh, Iriwera Tiri Sullivan, were demanded for an increase in the Māori seats. Once again, based on population, um, and including the population of our children as well. And it wasn't until 108 years later in 1975, we were introduced the um, Electoral Amendment Act followed, which changed for the government and the provisions was um, due to a change of government, the provisions were repealed. Um, in 1993, it wasn't until the Electric Act uh, that the number of Māori seats um, could actually be, to be determined by a formula based on the total population. And so um, this allowed um, electors to identify as Māori given the option of transitioning either from the Māori um, to the general role. And one of the questions that was asked earlier was about uh, what is the difference between the Māori and the general role? Um, and that it's actually based on population. Based on population. Um, uh, where the number of Māori registered on the Māori electorate roll, uh, that was the population based. So with the increase of population in, from 1993, where there were only four seats, um, we had managed to get an increase to seven seats in 2002. And so I just wanted to share the importance of that particular aspect of uh, the importance of determining for yourself um, the options of whether to uh, Māori electorate or general electorate roles uh, for consideration because that the population plays an important part once again determining number of seats. I think our, our tuahine might have a little bit more to share on that if we um, get to that a little bit later. Uh, Mona, be on the Hi. Hi, kapai. So as um, the rangatira was talking, uh, he mentioned uh, that around how the Māori electorates are determined. So at this current time, there are seven Māori electorates. And he, the number of Māori enrolled on the Māori roll and information from the census helps determine what the number of Māori electorates are, which are then reflected as the number of seats in Parliament. So if it's to Ngārohe Pōti, there are seven Māori electorates. There are also seven seats in Parliament, uh, which represents the voting that happens in these electorates. If we could just uh, skip to the next slide, I'm just going to quickly go through um, what the boundaries are of each of the Māori electorates at the moment. So on the left of your screen, you will see uh, the Māori electorate name there is Te Tai Tokero. Now, this area includes, the this is the northernmost seat. It includes Whangarei and parts of Auckland, so the north and west of Auckland. And on the right of our screen is um, the Tāmaki Makaurau um, Māori electorate. And that's roughly the equivalent to Greater Auckland, but not all of. Uh, but if we go into the next slide, we're going to see uh, the Waiariki on our left-hand side. And that includes Tauranga, Whakatane, Rotorua and Taupo. And those other areas that weren't included in the Tāmaki Makaurau electorate are included here on our right side, which is the Hauraki Waikato electorate. That's the northwestern North Island, and it includes Hamilton and Papakura, so parts of South Auckland. Um, on to the next one, we will see on our left, Te Tai Hauauru, 
which is the Western North Island. It includes Taranaki. It also includes where I live, which is the Manawatu and Whanganui Rohe. And then over on the uh, Te Tai Rāwhiti, on the eastern side, uh, is Te Ikaroa Rāwhiti, and that's East and South North Island, which includes Gisborne and Masterton. So the seventh and final electorate, uh, it covers the entirety of Te Waipaunamu, um, and the name of that electorate is Te Taitunga. So that's all of the South Island and nearby islands, and it is by far the largest electorate. Um, by area. So those are the boundaries of all of the different electorates at this time. I think so I'm the, thinking... um, the formula for the number of electorates, if I understood what you were saying, it is partly the number of people enrolled on the Māori roll as well as population size com coming from the census? I Katia, that is correct. And that information is fed through to Stats New Zealand. And it's up to them to provide the representation committee that information. And actually, not very long ago, the boundaries were reviewed. So uh, if you are on the general role, there have been some movements. Uh, but you can find more information if you're really interested in getting into the detail of where those boundaries are over on our website, which is vote.nz. It will take you there. Kapai, I think I'm passing it back to you. Kia ora rawa tu, kia tahuri aki waku tua kana, kia uru. Recent developments. So since since the increase of uh, number of seats in two thousand and two, um, there's been there's been some some other development within the Māori seats. And in two thousand and seven, the um, uh, the honourable Sir Peter Sharple proposed the creation of an eight seat for Māori living in in Australia called the Old Um and in 2017 there there were close to 170,000 Māori living over in Australia. Um, through its process, um, the normal process that Parliament follow, um, it, 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 um, it, it didn't get through the process, which kind of leads me to the next, next, leads me on to the next slide when we're looking at um, any bill that goes through, it's, it highlights down below um, the process. And so just as an example here, the purpose of this bill was to entrench the provisions of the Electoral Act 1993 that relates to the Māori electorates. And based on the population based, um, um, it was to, um, to ensure that the, there was a permanency in the Māori seats. And so it began with a bill being introduced in 2018 and it goes through the process of the first reading, uh, completed in September 2018, and then into the select committee, the select committee that I spoke about. Um, they, they will discuss issues relating to that. However, it only, when it got to the second reading, um, it actually failed or it was either withdrawn. Um, um, and that's where that this particular bill got to. But for those, uh, as you can see, if it was a, a, a full drawn out process, they would have gone to the committee of the whole house, but then following the third reading, and once the third reading has a pass, then to the rule of set. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'll um, just make a comment in, re in regard to that, that um, uh, people should be able to actually see that chart about how a bill is introduced and what stages it goes through uh, to be passed into an act of parliament and, and Kura had mentioned that. And uh, just recently there was an attempt by the Labour MP for Te Taitonga, so the one down here in the South Island where I live, um, he introduced a particular bill to have the Māori seats entrenched. And what this means is it's currently with the Electoral Act, what you actually have is much of the Electoral Act 
is entrenched, which means that in order to change the that electoral act, you need super majorities in parliament to pass changes. So, for example, when uh, we ad adopted MMP, there was a parliament that required 75% to make changes to implement that, uh, those changes there. And then the referendum uh, took place and then the referendum activated the change. Now, so for this particular bond, so, yeah, so a super majority just means it's raise the bar that any yeah. bill has to get over. Yeah. And this particular one didn't quite make it. That, yeah, yeah, well, what it was is that um, we wanted to make the entrenchment so it's, it's, it's that 75%. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, just earlier this week, we heard Judith Collins turning around and talking about wanting to move the election to maybe next year and reconvene the parliament and the parliament pass an act to allow it. That's what she was talking about. You need these super majorities to change aspects of the electoral act. And unfortunately, this particular one uh, didn't actually happen. If anything, in anything, it was more of a symbolic thing. For, um, it could be have the next slide, please. Is that me? Okay, so every person of New Zealand Maori descent may choose to enrol on the Maori or general electoral roll. So, Fanoma, it is important to enrol or to make sure that your details are up to date. Uh, once you have enrolled, Maori may go between the two electoral rolls during what they call the Maori electoral option, which the timeframes for that is set out in the Electoral Act 1993. And so the Electoral Commission, our role is to make sure that we deliver that the Māori electoral option. So every person of New Zealand Māori descent, you can choose whether you're on the Māori or the general role at the time when you first enrol. So if you're updating your address details because you might have moved whare, you'll have to wait until 2024. Uh, to change if you want to go between the general or the Māori role. So the decision Māori make can have an effect on the number of Māori seats, which we talked about a little bit earlier. And since MMP was introduced, the number of Māori seats has actually increased from four to seven, which is based on that formula that Micah talked about earlier, based on the data from the Māori electoral option, uh, along with the census. Now, the Māori electoral option is important for a number of reasons. It is the only time that Māori electors can change role types. So when you have an enrolment form and you're going through that, if you are of Māori descent, you can indicate on there that you are. And then you can also indicate on your enrolment form whether you want to go on the Māori role or the general role. Now, if you have indicated on your enrolment form that you are of Māori descent and you go on to the Māori role, these seven electorates, which you can see in front of you on the screen at the moment, are the electorates in which you would choose your, your Member of Parliament to represent you from these. Now, if you're on the general role, there are many more electorates which you choose from, but the party vote, now, whether you're on the general or the Māori role, all of the parties are available for you to vote for. Um, aye. So what have we got coming up next? So there's a few of the points I've talked about. Um, if you're of Māori descent, you can go on to the Māori role, but kei akwe te sitanga, you can be on the Māori role or the general role. Uh, there are seven electorates uh, that are Māori electorates. Um, and you can only swap between the Māori role or the general role um, in that Māori electoral option period. And the next one will come after the next general election. So we have our 
general election coming up very soon in October. Uh, and then in 2023, the next general election, if everything goes to plan. And then following that general election, uh, a census should take should be taking place and then the Māori electoral option will take place and that's when you get to change if that is what your decision is to do so. Uh, so general election coming up, if you haven't enrolled, it's important that you do so. Make sure your details are up to date. If you are of Māori descent, choose which role you would like to be on. And when you go into a voting place, the papers in which you um, should receive if you're on the Māori role will be specific to the candidates who are standing in the Māori electorates. If you're on the general role, will be specific to the candidates standing in your general electorate. Um, aye. Um, just for a little bit more clarification what are the uh, what is the impact what is the um, uh, difference between a Maori being on the Maori role and a Maori being on the general role the main impact of which role you choose on is who you are able to vote for that represents your electorate so if you are on the Maori role you will vote for a candidate standing in the Maori electorate if you are on the general role, you will vote for a candidate standing in the general electorate. Good point, Tina. Tino, and just uh, going back to what uh, you shared with us earlier, the um, more people on and registered on the Māori role, as well as census data, will may increase or decrease the number of Māori electorates? Aye, that's right. So depending on the number of people on the Māori role, the sense of data, it could mean that actually the number of Māori seats decrease or increase. So it really depends on what's going on um, with that, um, with the data from the census and the Māori role. Um, I see that somebody has asked a question about why can't people switch between the general role and the Māori role more often? Now, it is set in the, in the Act that this is the period of time which must go between Māori electoral options. Following the last uh, general election, a review was done and there was a paper um, presented to uh, Parliament to recommend that Māori able are able to change roles more often however that was declined by parliament so therefore it currently stays as is so um, until 2024 that's uh, the next time that that will be made available to do if i can uh, come in here there's also some policy reasons behind that because if you get these large shifts over short periods of time let's say over a year or so, what you actually are doing is altering, altering boundaries all the time. So you could have a large shift in some of those Auckland electorates, and if, if a, a number of ones shift from the Māori role over to the general role, then a lot of those uh, little electorates there in Auckland, all of a sudden, they, they become bigger and they got to start doing the, the boundaries a bit more to equalize things up. So it's from really a policy and a practical reason you know, about every five years in that. This might be a little bit stabby in the ducky, um, but how many um, elect Māori electorates do we think we might be able to have if all Māori were enrolled on the Māori uh, role? I'll have a guess. I'll have a guess, a guesstimate. Because we've got around about 52% of Māori on the Māori role, and about 48% on the general role. So I would say perhaps an, another seven seats, or perhaps an eighth seat. So around about that 14 to 15 uh, mark there, just on a pure, population those numbers that we know 52 and 48 mm. i could be wrong i could be wrong would you have anything to add to that mona 
Yeah, we would have to definitely understand the information that would come from the census and uh, to really understand what an accurate response to that would be. Um, so we would wait for uh, that information to come through and the stats in New Zealand to really apply in the representation commission to do that as well. And this might seem a little bit obvious, but if we moved our residents from one Māori electorate to another Māori electorate, we'd be voting within that for the members, uh, sorry, the candidates for that new electorate where we now live. If you've enrolled and updated your details um, and you've moved to another electorate, I would suggest you do update your details so that you have uh, the right papers to vote um, and that you are voting for the correct candidates in which you reside in. Katie Pai. Okay. A uh, question from Facebook. Um, who controls the number of Māori seats? Is that a parliament responsibility or is that the Electoral Commission? So through the Māori electoral option and the census, that information goes um, through to, as you were talking about earlier, Michael, that formula. So that information goes through and as per the legislation, um, it's, quite, it's quite clear about um, how many seats. So um, the responsibility per se, from an electoral commission perspective, we provide the information uh, to make sure that that's accurate and up to date. Um, here's an interesting one. Uh, why can't I vote both in the general and Māori electorate? Uh, I mean, it was done back in early times where people with uh, lands and different uh, electorates could vote in both. Well, I suppose it's just in regard to that principle of one vote that you get to vote for one representative and that you've got to choose which representative that you actually want. So separate from the party, that you've got to actually decide do you want the Māori to, uh, the Māori MP to represent your interests or do you want the particular, the local uh, general electorate MP? And I think there was a question there in regard to earlier as well, wasn't there in regard to uh, the pros and cons of either belonging to the Māori on the Māori role or the general role? Uh, I, I wrote an article about this. Uh, well, no, I was interviewed for the newspaper a couple of years ago on this very topic. And uh, the answer that I supplied, it may be helpful, is that well, you and your own whānau got to decide for yourself which MP best represents you and your whānau. Speak to them. So if the things that the Māori electorate uh, members are talking about interest you and are of importance to you, then you should be on the Māori roll. But if the local MP, you may actually even know the local MP in the general ones, if, if they uh, far better represent you, then perhaps you should be on the general role than that. <laughs> Good point, Tewa. Um, here's a really interesting one, and perhaps Kuda might be able to share some insight on this. Um, how do you see tikanga and te tiriti o wetangi fitting into what is largely now a Westminster colonial structure of parliament and law? Not necessarily electoral related, but very interesting question. Ah, oh, that's a, a, a really good question. Um, in terms of uh, tikanga operating within uh, a Westminster system or colonial structure, um, there are there are some really good examples of where tikanga is expressed within Parliament, um, and particularly around the Commission and State Opening uh, of Parliament. Uh, when we receive uh, international guests, there is the, the uh, tikanga aspect. And um, even in most functions that are held on parliament, there's, there has been a, a large request from members of parliament 
for the requirement of a tikanga aspect. Now, um, in comparison to say 20 years ago, it was very 20 to 30 years ago, you saw very little. So I think it's going to take it's going to take a time and progression as as uh, we start to evolve in terms of tetriti or waitangi. Um, that's that's going to be a continuing debate, um, and so uh, which actually allows for which would probably mean that more research needs to be implemented in terms of what does a tikanga the Treaty of Waitangi um, process or parliament look like within the Westminster system? No way. Um, we haven't got too much time for too many questions. At the tuahine, a couple of really quick fire ones from you. Is it too uh, late to enrol? Kaore, not too late. Go to vote.nz if you've got a New Zealand driver's license and New Zealand passport or a Realme account. Go and enrol there, update your details. But hey, you know, the two day have just changed. You can enrol right up to when you go and cast, you can enrol when you cast your vote. You can also enrol on election day. So um, you've got some time, but it is easier for um, electors when you go to cast your vote if you do it now and you do it soon, you should receive an easy vote card in the mail. Another quick one, my son has turned 18, will he receive an application in the post to vote? Uh, if he hasn't enrolled on the provisional roll, then Carl. But the easiest thing to do is go to our website, vote.nz, get him to update or enrol there, update his details. If you don't have access to the internet, you can give us a call. It's free, a free number, 0800 36 76 56. Or if you're uh, anywhere near one of our tuddy, please feel free to go in there. Tuddy being office, please go in there and um, visit our people, talk to them, and they'll take you through the process. 0800 36 76 56. Another quick one from Facebook. Is it true that if you're on the Māori electoral roll, your party vote doesn't count? Kei te he rawa. That is very incorrect. Um, if you're on the Māori electoral roll, you'll be able to vote for the candidate, which is the candidate a candidate which is standing in the Māori electorate, you are also able to vote for the parties listed, which are the exact same parties which are on the general um, elect when you're on the general roll, the same parties on both papers. Um, and then also this year, um, there are also the two referendums that people can vote uh, yes or no for. Here's another interesting one. Um, uh, you know, an, an issue... Uh, everywhere across the globe is getting voters to the voting booth. Um, this one, is there any understanding about the reluctance of many Māori to enrol on the Māori roll? Um, from some of the mahi that we've been doing, talking to Fano, there's a range of reasons. Um, some Fano talk about how this is not something that we talk about at home, um, but we want to motivate Fano to be having these conversations, not just with eligible um, age, the eligible age group, but start having this conversation with Tamariki, um, them not being aware of that. You know, we can have those conversations at home. I'll be taking my Tamaiti, who's only one, down to the polling booth so he, and every year I'll be doing that to make sure that he sees these things happening and that these things are um, normal part of the mahi uh, day you know it comes around every three years and I want to make sure that my time is so you know each of us having that responsibility um, but then there's also other you know apathetic voters not really their confidence and potentially the system or um, the the processes. So those are some of the corridor that we've had from the Electoral Commission, but um, both Matua uh, Paido and Matua uh, Kura might have experiences of their own. Yeah, my tamariki like to come to the uh, come voting with me too. Or they they get some funny looks when they pinch my sticker and walk off with I just voted on their test. An old, of a five-year-old here, <laughs> Tamara. We've probably got time for our very last question now, also from Facebook. How long does it take if you're on the general electorate roll uh, to move to the mild electoral roll? If you, um, so 
we aren't you aren't able to swap roles outside of a multi electoral option unless of course you're enrolling for the first time so when it is the multi electoral option period dependent on when your papers get received at our tuddy um, at our offices for those to be processed it should happen quite quickly um so the multi electoral option coming up in 2024 there's a four month period in which you have the opportunity to change roles if that's what you are wanting to do and within that four month period if you've sent your form in or um and you've filled it out then that should happen immediately and then you should get notification that that is what happened and what role you're on and on that note actually if you are already enrolled and you received an envelope in the mail not so long ago with orange man on the front inside and on that letter it will tell you what role you're on and how is it decided how often the mild electoral option will pop up uh, that's set in the legislation um, in the Electoral Act, sorry, 1993. Um, so that's set for every, uh, so the last one was in 2018, next one being 2024, must follow a census. Um, it's uh, just around the time and it just happens to fall after the next general election. So there would have been two between the two, two general elections between the two Māori electoral options. Uh, well, thank you. Many thanks to the panel um, for providing your expertise and your insights this evening. And thank you to everybody uh, who has participated. Um, before we go, um, a reminder uh, that if you aren't able to physically join us at Parliament, you are very welcome to take a virtual tour of Parliament um, by downloading the Parliament XR app for free in the Google Play Store or the Apple Store. Um, it's available in both English and in Māori um, and it's a virtual tour through a lot of the important and famous places on the parliamentary precinct. <laughs> and a reminder to uh, that the House of Parliament, well that is your house and so please uh, do follow, give us a follow on Twitter, Instagram and Facebook. Um, and our engagement team regularly posts in there to keep you updated with what's going on, things that are happening, and anything interesting as well. Norera, tēnā koutou katoa e ngā iwi, ko piki mai nē ki runga ki te whare pāre mata i tēnei ahi ahi pō, huri huri noa, tēnā koutou katoa. Kia ora, kia ora. Ah, whakai e mi mai ngā pūtō i kura upa mai ngā wakaro. Tu ia te kawereo ki runga i ngā tūwara waka pita i te ware kōrero o tātou ki te ao māra manai. E rongo waka iri ia ki runga toru turu o uti waka maua kia tīnā uie tāiki.